Bernardina Maria Mercedes Aponte Morano Bola, alias Ia, was born in Corrientes on May 20, 1930. Corrientes is a city located north of Buenos Aires on the Paraná River's banks. Candila, Ia's mother, was a housewife, and Camilo Bola Aponte, her father, was a lieutenant colonel in Uriburu's army during the 1930 coup d'état. Ia had a sibling who ultimately followed in their father's footsteps and joined the military. They grew up at a period of upheaval and power shift, and with her father in the center of it all, the family was well known. From an early age, it was clear that Yia cherished the better things in life and cherished her family's social standing. When her family moved to Buenos Aires, Bola fell in love with the city's hustling and bustling. She loved the city center's towering structures and European atmosphere, as well as the diversity it provided. From an early age, she enjoyed strolling along Avenida Corrientes and absorbing whatever was popular at the moment. Yia attended college and earned a teaching certificate after high school, but she had no intention of ever working a day in her life. Rather than that, she dated a succession of attractive bachelors, usually men of affluence with big pockets. Yia always looked her best, one could hear her approaching a room by the ringing of her bangles. She exercised by swimming, which kept her tall body sleek and toned. She was endearing and engaging, and when she talked, everyone believed her. Yia gave up her maiden name when she married civil lawyer Antonio Murano as is traditional in Argentina. People believe that she did this to avoid association with her brother, a well-known general at the time. Antonio maintained that his wife was not need to work and that he would look after her. That is exactly what Yia wanted to hear, her dreams had come true, she would be a lady of leisure, living in one of the world's most beautiful cities. However, the couple's private lives was far from spectacular. They shared a musty two-bedroom apartment plagued by rising moisture and worn-out furnishings. Yia's house was diametrically opposed to her looks. She was usually well-dressed and seemed to be worth a million dollars. To do this, the lawyer's wife lived far above her means, constantly splurging on jewelry and expensive clothes. She bragged of owning 110 pairs of shoes at one time. Although her husband Antonio was retired, Yia spent little time with him. The tall, beautiful fashionista liked to be out and about, drinking tea with friends and attending movies or theatrical performances. She was well liked by her pal since they knew they could always count on her. Yia was always a phone call away if they needed anything. However, she was more than a wonderful friend, she was also a very busy lover. Yia had many extramarital relationships during her marriage. She subsequently claimed that she was engaged with Argentina's wealthiest guy, who purchased her two properties on Avenida Independencia and Luis Sanz P. These were centrally situated in Buenos Aires, close to stores, restaurants, and patisseries. Yia openly confessed to having an affair with a senior police officer as well. Additionally, she was claimed to have had liaisons with a prominent trade union leader and a presidential contender. She ultimately admitted to having slept with over 200 men throughout her lifetime. Yia was clearly obsessed with power, intercourse, and money. None of which she discovered in Antonio Morano, her spouse. It is unclear if he was ignorant of her adultery or decided to turn a blind eye. Antonio and Yia have a son, Martin, together. He had a nanny who served as a mother figure for him, and he never had a strong bond with his actual mother. And, as a result of Yia's transgressions between the sheets, many people began to doubt Antonio's paternity. Mart did not have a very pleasant upbringing, to put it mildly. His mother was often gone, and when she was there, she was always judgmental of him. Yia, the narcissistic mother, constantly advised her kid to be more alive. What he lacked in boldness, his mother compensated for Martin remembered Yia escorting him to her clandestine meetings, claiming they were seeing a distant relative. She would address him like follows. Martin Cito, be kind to your uncle so he would give me wonderful gifts. Martin was also instructed to be silent regarding his mother's so-called friends. As a little child, he never questioned his mother. As an adult, he realized she brought him with her solely as a cover. She pretended to take Martin to the park to give herself a reason to leave the home and rendezvous with whatever her lover was at the moment. When Martin finished from high school, Yia advised Antonio to remain at home out of worry for his safety. She worried that the intensity of his emotions at witnessing his only kid graduate would do permanent harm to his heart. Meanwhile, it was a ruse designed to allow Yia to bring one of her boyfriends along as her date. Although Martin was used to this kind of behavior, it hurt his heart that she kept his father from his graduation. Antonio was well aware that his marriage was gone at this point. Yia was free to do as she wanted once the marriage split. Despite the fact that Antonio paid a sizable amount in alimony, Yia could never have enough. She refused to lower her level of life but also refused to look for work. She needed to devise another plan. 
The 40-something single socialite wanted to reinvent herself, she indicated to her pals that she had discovered a method to invest money and get returns much superior to those provided by banks. Yia contacted a few of her wealthy acquaintances secretly and promised them huge returns on their investments. Of course, it was all a hoax, but Yia's silver tongue could sell sand in the desert. She had a manner of expressing herself that drew people in and convinced them of her credibility. Three of her closest friends entrusted Yia with their life savings. Yia signed promissory notes as a guarantee. It was 1979, and Argentina remained under dictator Jorge Rafael Videla's control. Crime was not prevalent in Buenos Aires during the so-called Dirty War. The military junta unleashed widespread terror in order to eliminate its political adversaries. Close to 30,000 individuals are estimated to have perished or vanished at the hands of the junta. Individuals had to watch their backs, and if they were deemed inclined to socialism or left-wing Peronism, their lives were at risk. As a result of all of this, no one suspected Yia Murano, a well-dressed mother from a reputable area, of defrauding rich widows and divorcees of their life fortunes. 1979 was a difficult year, and Yia had already lost two close friends by the end of February. Both Nilda Gamba and Lelia Formasano de Ayala had experienced cardiac arrests. With all of the country's stressors, it's unsurprising that it all became too much for them. Then, on March 24, Yia's second cousin, a close friend, died of a heart attack as well. Carmen Zulema del Giorgio de Venerini, or Mima, they came ill at her apartment and sought medical assistance. She lost her balance at the top of a set of steps, and as she fell all the way down, neighbors raced to her aid. A neighbor who was a doctor attempted but failed to resuscitate her. While they waited for the paramedics, Mima's cousin Yia entered her flat. She explained to the doorman, Jose Gonzalez, that she need entry to her cousin's apartment in order to retrieve her contact book and notify her family of the tragedy. Yia emerged moments afterwards and escorted her cousin to the ambulance. Mima, however, never recovered consciousness. She died on the way to the hospital in the ambulance, with Yia at her side. Diana Mara Venturini, Mima's adult daughter, had an apartment with her mother on Hippolto Irigoyen Street. Mima's late spouse was a prosperous businessman who bestowed upon her a sizable fortune. Mima and Diana lived well and were never in want. Diana was devastated by the death of her mother. She was perplexed as to how her mother could be happy and healthy one day and then die the next. She had no history of cardiac issues and still died of a heart attack. Diana considered her mother's last months and wondered whether there had been any warning signals they had overlooked. Yia Murano, Mima's second cousin, was a frequent visitor to their house. Mima was always showering Yia with plants, while Yia lavished Mima with sweets. Not that she was an accomplished baker, but she had an uncanny ability to locate the finest patisseries in town. Yia excelled at one thing, shopping. Mima had few concerns when Yia contacted her about investing her money. She sought clarification from Yia and then carefully invested a modest sum to begin with. Yia repaid the money after a few weeks, along with the accumulated interest. Mima was sold, Yia and her lawyer friend shown an aptitude for investing by agreeing to give over a check for 20 million pesos. This was a significant choice, given Mima's history of relying on her husband to manage their money. Yia provided her with as many information and guarantees as she could and left her with a promissory note in lieu of a deposit. Yia was very candid regarding the future steps. She said that she would immediately go to Mar del Plata to deliver Mima's check to her lawyer friend. According to Yia's close pals, she is both friend and lover. In any case, she would put Mima's check into the investment account with this guy and return the whole money, plus interest, to Mima on March 27. Yia paid Mima a visit upon her return from Mar del Plata, assuring her that everything had gone according to plan and that Mima would receive her money shortly. Yia paid frequent visits in the days and weeks that followed, which helped Mima relax about her finances. Diana did observe, though, how protective her mother was of the promissory note. The only evidence she had was that the 20 million pesos given to Yia originated with her. However, when Diana sorted through her mother's belongings following her untimely death, she was unable to locate the note. Diana's aunt, Yia Murano was the only other person who knew where Mima kept the letter. Diana repeated Yia's acts on the day of her mother's death and was struck by how strange they were. To begin, Yia had already visited Mima. According to Jose Gonzalez, the doorman, she came carrying a little gift, which he thought was a box of tea time goodies. He never saw her go, but when Carmen emerged from her apartment seeking assistance, Yia was no longer there. While Mima's doctor neighbor attempted CPR, Yia returned and informed Jose that she required access to her cousin's apartment. She wanted to get her address book in order to contact her family members and tell them of the accident. 
the doorman did not consider it odd in the midst of the commotion and did not obstruct her. Yea was only inside for a brief moment before leaving. She was carrying some papers and a tiny bottle. As she walked away, she made an odd remark. Oh my God, this is the third time in a short period of time that one of my friends has died. This is a very frightening remark, given that Mima had not yet died at the time Yea said it. Yea wept during Mima's funeral. She made a great show of weeping, but her eyes never filled with tears. Diana couldn't stop herself from wondering whether the crocodile tears were part of a performance. However, Yea was extremely self-absorbed and centered everything on herself, so this was not entirely out of character. Diana couldn't shake the suspicion that her aunt was concealing something. She inquired with the doorman as to whether anybody was in the flat on the day Mima died. He informed her that Yea had gone inside to get Carmen's phone book in order to contact her relatives. Diana was quick to discover the phone book had remained unchanged. Additionally, she confirmed with friends and family that Yea never called anyone. Diana suspected that Yea entered that day solely for the purpose of seizing the promissory note and erasing all evidence of her debt to Mima. Diana alerted police, convinced that her aunt had caused her mother's death in order to avoid repaying her money. She informed her of the dubious investment scheme and the peculiar circumstances surrounding Mima's demise. Additionally, she said that Yea was obligated to compensate her mother on March 27, three days after she died. Diana saw this as an obvious motivation for murder. A second autopsy revealed that Mima's system contained a significant amount of cyanide. Later reports said that she had sufficient cyanide in her bloodstream to kill an elephant. A modest dose, about 150 to 200 milligrams, is sufficient to kill an adult in less than an hour. Mima's untimely demise was not caused by a heart attack, she had been poisoned. Yea was suspected of possessing cyanide in the tiny vial she was seen carrying as she left Mima's residence that day. She had tea and cakes with her cousin one final time, providing her with an excellent opportunity to conceal the poison. When police learned about the other two unexpected deaths in Yea Murano's circle of acquaintances, they were worried. Investigators convinced a judge to order the exhumation of both Nilda Gamba and Lilia Formasano de Ayala's remains based on evidence gathered regarding Mima's death. Both tested positive for cyanide traces. However, the quantities were insignificant and might have been hydrogen cyanide. This may have happened as a result of smoke inhalation or as a result of the natural decay process. Mima's body was poisoned with potassium cyanide, which is found in rat poison, insecticide, and silver polish. According to a Sam Houston State University article, cyanide poison detection in 2012 looked like this. Because cyanide has a relatively short half-life, minutes to hours, depending on the matrix, Toxicological detection of cyanide to confirm cyanide poisoning may be possible only within the first few hours after exposure. Cyanide levels in blood samples collected the next day during autopsy were found to drop by about 79%. Cyanide production may also occur post-mortem, complicating the interpretation of cyanide results. Nilda and Lelia's remains were exhumed in 1979, more than a month after their deaths. Cyanide tests would have been inconclusive. Nonetheless, investigators at the time were unconvinced. They were aware that there was a great deal of circumstantial evidence connecting the fatalities. Nilda Gamba lived alone in apartment number 20, directly across the street from Yia Murano. Nilda went to Yia's for supper on Friday 10th of February. They had an enjoyable evening together, and Nilda remained until 1 a.m. the following morning, the doorman observed something odd. Nilda was accustomed to waiting for the newspaper in the morning. She'd open her door and take it as soon as it arrived. She did not on that Saturday morning. The doorman became worried when the newspaper remained on her doorstep by mid-morning. He invited Jess Garza, another building tenant, to accompany him inside Nilda's flat. They tried to unlock the door and requested assistance from the cops. When police officers knocked down the door, they discovered Nilda's corpse lying face down on the living room floor, her left hand holding her stomach. When her doctor paid her a visit the night before, Nilda complained of severe stomach pains and nausea. Nilda informed the physician that she had supper with a neighbor and close friend. She said that Yea purchased some delectable petty fours for dessert. Yea was immediately summoned by the doctor to tend to her sick buddy. Yea returned to her own flat once Nilda had calmed down. Nilda slipped into a coma throughout the night and never awoke. She died early Sunday morning, 11th of February. Yea contacted Dr. Drenner, whom Nilda had seen the previous afternoon, and requested a death certificate, stating that the cause of death was a heart attack. The physician declined, stating that he was not the last person to treat her and was unsure of the reason of her death. Yea finally located another physician willing to provide the death certificate, for a fee. And Yea bribed him cheerfully. 
Nilda's death was attributed to a non-traumatic cardiac arrest. There was no autopsy performed. A month before Nilda died, neighbors noticed she had been missing for three days. They notified authorities, who broke into Nilda's house and discovered her unconscious on the floor. Thankfully, they were able to resuscitate her and transport her to the hospital. Medical personnel determined that Nelda had been in a diabetic coma. However, when she died in identical circumstances, investigators questioned whether this was the result of a botched poisoning attempt by Ia. Ia Murano's other close friend was Lelia Formasano de Ayala. The two women frequented the seaside vacation town of Mar del Plata and were inseparable. On February 19, a distraught Ia rushed to Layla's residence in search of her. Because the doorman was not there, she tracked down his wife. Yia explained to the lady that she was urgently searching for Lelia, who had returned home while they were out on the town due to her health. The doorman's wife recommended they check up on her, but Yia claimed she didn't want to bother Lelia more if she was home and just ignored her buzzing. If Lelia was suffering from a stomach illness, it was imperative that she relax. The doorman's wife thought this meeting odd, but then again, this was Yia Murano, everywhere she went, there was always a commotion. Yia and a group of friends came to Lelia's home the next night to pick her up for a movie, but she did not answer the door. Due to Yia informing their friends about Lelia's stomach bug, no one pressed and assumed she was not in the mood to see anyone. On February 22, Lelia's neighbors contacted the police to voice their worry about her. Nobody had seen her in three days, and her flat smelled terrible. The police entered Lelia's apartment through the balcony and discovered a dead Lelia sitting in a chair in front of the television. A teacup and a dish of food leftovers were on a side table next to her. Police officers discovered petty fours in her refrigerator. This time, the death certificate was signed by the funeral home's physician. Without performing a post-mortem investigation, the physician claimed that the cause of death was a non-traumatic myocardial infarction, a heart attack. The three distinct friendships were dissected by investigators. Apart from being 40-something socialites with money to burn and leisure to kill, what did they have in common? It was not difficult to prove that, like Mima, Nilda and Lelia had invested their money with Yia Murano. And, like Mima, both died before Yia could repay them. Interest was promised. It was a sizable sum of money, close to $300,000. As with Mima, Nilda and Lelia allowed Yia to convince them to invest a small amount of money so she could demonstrate the scheme's reliability. Yia added phony interest to the money from other investors, betting that her friends would invest with her again. And it was profitable. After receiving a handsome return, Nilda, Lelia, and Mima were all eager to use Yia's investing services again. Yia accepted gracefully and reassured them that they were making the right choice. Yia went out of her way to reassure her investors that their money was in good hands after she repaid them. She invested a great deal of time in their friendships, they spent many afternoons together, enjoying afternoon tea or going to the movies. Yia called frequently and expressed a genuine interest in their lives. Yia was supposed to reimburse her friend, Lelia, on the 19th of February, just days after Nilda's death. Lelia's body was discovered on February 22nd. Investigators were now more certain than ever that Yia was responsible for the murders of her neighbor, friend, and cousin. They discovered that Mima's death was a carbon copy of the other two. Mima anticipated receiving her money back on March 27th. On the 24th, she was extremely ill, nauseated and dizzy. She crawled out of her apartment in order to summon assistance. She rose to her feet but collapsed due to vertigo, falling down the stairwell. Her neighbors became aware of the disturbance and rushed to her aid. Yia Murano arrived at that precise moment. She eagerly inquired of her neighbors whether Mima had said anything before she passed out. Yia then vanished into Mima's apartment, stealing the promissory note and erasing evidence of her previous visit. She was in the ambulance with Mima when she died. Investigators spoke with ambulance personnel who responded to the call, and they shared a chilling story. Apparently, as soon as they informed Ia that Mima had died and there was nothing they could do, she inquired as to whether they anticipated an autopsy. It was an odd question to ask someone who had recently experienced the loss of a family member. However, how was she able to poison them? Petty fours were discovered in Lelia's refrigerator in Mima's apartment. When Nilda called the doctor, she informed him about her previous evening's dinner with Ia, which included petty fours for dessert. Due to the moist nature of the cake and the fact that cyanide smells like bitter almond, no one would suspect the delicacies were poison. According to investigators, Yi obtained cyanide from one of her lovers, an unidentified doctor. Of course, a resourceful woman like Yi would have had no difficulty obtaining cyanide. There is a possibility that she used rat poison or insecticide. Thus, Yi not only conned her closest friends, but also murdered them. 
Yia concocted her investment scheme in order to pad her own pockets. And by the time the police apprehended her, she was out of money. She had depleted her funds by paying fictitious interest to secure future investments. Additionally, she used it to fund her extravagant lifestyle, which included dressing herself in expensive clothing and jewelry. Yia Murano was arrested on the 27th of April 1979 at her home on Mexico Street. The media dubbed her the poisoner of Montserrat, after the urban neighborhood in which she lived and murdered. Yia was frequently photographed wearing oversized sunglasses, which gave her an air of glamour. Even later in her career, she always wore sunglasses during studio interviews, they became her signature. When police apprehended her, she did not resist arrest and pleaded not guilty to all charges. She begged. Please, how am I going to prepare poison pastries if I don't know how to cook? When questioned about the money her friends invested through her, he had denied stealing it. She insisted that she had received money from all three of her friends. Additionally, she believed they died of natural causes. Her statements were evasive and philosophical in tone, stating things like, The only thing left is to live from day to day. And there is nothing we can do about it except bury them and mourn. However, during the hours of interviews, one statement provided a brief glimpse into Yia Murano's mind. Addressing her interviewer, she made the following remark. Darling, one thing you must understand, murderers never tell the truth. Yia was discovered unconscious on the floor of her cell in 1980, while on remand at Asesa prison. She had survived an aneurysm. Following treatment, she was returned to prison to await trial. However, that day never came. After three years in prison, her attorneys were successful in obtaining her acquittal. The judge determined that there was insufficient physical evidence to charge her with the murders of her friends. Yia spent three years in the community and grew accustomed to her celebrity status. She was frequently spotted around town, wearing her signature oversized sunglasses and charming everyone she encountered. However, her days of liberty were numbered. In July 1985, the court reversed its earlier decision and declared Yia's acquittal null and void. Yia's retrial occurred concurrently with the trial of the Juntas, one of the most prominent cases in Argentina's history, and as a result, little attention was paid to Yia's story. This time, she was found guilty of three homicides and sentenced to life in prison. Yia informed anyone who would listen during this time period that her case involved a miscarriage of justice. She maintained her innocence, and as soon as she obtained a 24-hour pass, she appeared on national television to plead her case. Eventually, the infamous poisoner received a fortunate break when the contentious two-for-one law worked in her favor. This statute stipulated that no person should be held on remand for more than two years. If they are, as Yia was, each additional day spent in precautionary detention counts as two. This resulted in the abolition of numerous prison sentences. Yia's case was unique in that the judge considered the time she spent in prison between 1978 and 1982 while awaiting a trial date. Ultimately, she served only two-thirds of her life sentence. Yia sent a box of chocolates to each judge who signed her release form upon her release in November 1995, to express her gratitude for their leniency. No one appears to have dared to eat the chocolates, as no one felt compelled to sample the poisoner of Montserrat's culinary delicacies. When asked why people refused to eat her food, Yia always shrugged her shoulders and maintained her innocence, stating, I have never compelled anyone to consume my pastries. Yia regained her celebrity status after relocating to Buenos Aires. And the media reaped the benefits, she was hired to write a column for a fashion magazine, where readers devoured her advice. She made certain she remained in the spotlight as well, always agreeing to speak about her life and the crimes for which she had been charged. In 1998, she appeared on Mirtha Legrand's popular daytime talk show and dropped a bombshell. She stated that she rediscovered love and married. The following day, the alleged husband appeared sheepishly on the same show, stating that he desired to annul the marriage. They had spent only one night together, and she vowed never to reveal the truth about their sham marriage. Yet he did so on national television, claiming that when she stated her name as Mercedes Bola, her real birth name, he had no idea he had agreed to marry Yia Murano. Yia returned to Mirtha Legrand's table many years later, bringing some baked goods. She mocked the host, adamant that she had tried one. Mirtha braved a bite near the end of the show, while the nation held its breath. Fortunately, nothing happened to her. Yia was delighted by the scene, which made her laugh at her own expense. On the street, she was approached and asked for her autograph. She was constantly joking with them, offering cakes or sweets and implying that they were poison. She was affectionately referred to as the well-groomed grandmother with a dark past and an evil sense of humor. There has even been a critically acclaimed theater production titled Yea the Musical, 
which takes a light-hearted look at the circumstances surrounding Yia's heartless murders. In 2001, she married retired journalist Julio Bannon, her third and final husband. They met on a bus tour, and Yia made certain he didn't forget about her. Julio was blind and stated on one occasion that he married her solely to obtain medication. Despite her claims that the marriage was happy, Julio's children claim that he threw her out several times. However, Yia was always able to find her way back. The family was less than enamored with her, and she wreaked havoc. She once bribed a taxi driver with 100 pesos to inform Julio's daughter that her boyfriend was cheating on her. This was not true, and despite the taxi driver's admission, Yia maintained her innocence. Yia also stole a family heirloom, a priceless golden headpiece, from Julio's collection of valuables on another occasion. Julio was enraged and refused to believe her when she attempted to place the blame on the concierge. Yia began cooking for Julio and his family during this time period. This was unusual, given Yia's reputation as a terrible cook. According to Julio's daughter. Since my stepmother began cooking for us, I've spent the last week experiencing stomach pain, dizziness, vomiting, and fainting. Usually, she would prepare noodles and tea for us. My father contracted pneumonia shortly afterwards. The straw that broke the camel's back came when Julio's daughter discovered that her father had spent his entire life savings of 30,000 pesos. Newspaper scraps folded into the shape of banknotes were stored in the money box. Keeping in mind that Julio was blind, it's clear that Yir replaced the cash with newspaper fragments in order to deceive him. Julio asked her to leave and made it clear she would never be welcome back in his home. From Julio's home, Yia Murano entered a nursing home, where she died alone on 26 April 2014, at the age of 83. She is buried in Buenos Aires Chacarita Cemetery, alongside Nilda, Lelia, and Mima, a sort of grim afterlife reunion. Her name is omitted from her headstone. Her family did not wish for her to be remembered as Montserrat's poisoner. Rather than that, it honors Mercedes Bola. Martin Murano, Yia's son, wrote a book titled My Mother, Yia Murano. He recounts a loveless childhood with a mother who is obsessed with herself. He recalled a chilling incident when he was 10 years old, she had purchased pastries from a neighborhood bakery and offered him some. She slashed it in half and stood there watching him take his first bite. Just as he was about to bite into the cake, his mother grabbed it and tossed it into the household incinerator. Martin believed she attempted poisoning him but was unable to carry it out. Martin also claims in the book that his mother confessed to him. She allegedly stated that she laced the tea bags, not the pastries, with poison. It was her most closely guarded secret. When Yia was still alive, the book was published. She publicly expressed her distress upon reading it. She stated in an interview with an Argentine newspaper that Martin had paid her a visit from New York, where he resided, and that they had buried the hatchet. Martin asserted that this never occurred. He was estranged from her and learned of her death three days later on television. When she was arrested in 1978, the media speculated that she had killed previously, with an estimated 10 victims. Especially two cousins' friends, during a time when she wasn't broke. This has never been established. Yia's case remains one of the most iconic in Argentina's criminal history to this day. She reveled in her notoriety and maintained that there was no evidence that she had murdered her friends, insisting that they had all died naturally. If that were the case, it would be the most bizarre coincidence of the century, she owed money to three friends, all of whom died shortly after having tea with Yia. The majority of people believe she denied guilt while holding the proverbial smoking gun, it could only have been Yia, Montserrat's infamous poisoner.